Hello? Oh, great. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the last session. Uh, this session is entitled Into the Latent Space, which is a really exciting, cool title. And uh, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Manish Sahani from UCL as our first speaker. OK. Um, so thank you very much, Sean. Thanks uh, to Christian and Eugenia, I hope I said that right, um, for the invitation to speak here. Um, I um, withheld some data from them, uh, from Christian and Eugenia, for a long time, that being my title and abstract, and that thereby managed to probe their prior over what it is I was going to speak on uh, and managed to end up in a session that's all about, uh, far for me, uh, data analysis. Uh, that was a pretty good prior. It was. It was Clearly a modal selection, uh, but there's another mode, uh, and I'm actually going to pick the other mode to speak about. Uh, but I will talk about latent variables, so they titled it perfectly. Um, all right, so uh, this is a theory talk. It's a uh, talk that developed some work that we've been doing over the last, um, well, we've resumed doing over the last two or three years. Uh, but I want to start actually by pointing out the, um, the sort of people who I've been involved with uh, doing this and just make the acknowledgement at the beginning in case I run out of time to do so at the end. Um, and it's going to be based on work that actually started when I was a postdoc uh, more years ago than I want to mention uh, with working with Peter Dan. Uh, and uh, we sort of had, had thought about representations of uncertainty uh, with the idea that we were looking for ways that you one can compute with those representations effectively. Um, worked on the, uh, on the representation, and then sort of, you know, had some ideas about computation, but put them to to aside. They're sort of in the discussion of the paper in the end. It then lay dormant for a while, but then in the last sort of two to three years, it's picked up again, and particularly uh, working with two excellent graduate students at Gatsby, uh, Esther Vetesh and Kevin uh, Lee, who are both here. Uh, they had posters yesterday. I'll mention a little bit about what they talked about. Um, and so, and they'll be at the workshop. So, if you'd like to speak with them, please, please do. I also just wanted to say this is theor theoretical work. We're thinking about the underlying principles of learning and how they might come about. Um, as I said at the beginning, it's data free, uh, and I think it's important to say that I think many people, in theory, find it quite difficult to find funding to do this sort of work. And so, I also wanted to put on this initial uh, slide um, the, f the funders who have provided uh, the support for this. Uh, the Gatsby uh, Foundation, who have, of course, very generously uh, provided support for the unit over a number of years, but also the Simons Foundation, who've been um, sort of involved in thinking about both experimental work, data analysis, and theory uh, over the last um, some number of years now th uh, through the uh, uh, collaboration of the global brain. And, and I think uh, that's a very important uh, contribution to thinking in the field. Okay, I'm going to start with uh, something that is probably quite familiar to people here at COSIDE, which is the uh, proposition, if you like, that the way that we as humans and other animals process information often very accurately respects the uncertainty in that information to come up with relatively optimal conclusions or actions on the basis of that uncertain information. And there's now you know, a host of experiments that have demonstrated this. I'll give you just four quick snapshots. Uh, but these are really, uh, the point isn't to talk about these experiments, it's just to, to set the, the um, groundwork for, for where we want to go. So here's the first one by Mark Ernst and Marty Banks. Uh, back in 2002, they asked people to judge the height of a little strip that they could see, uh, but actually they were seeing a bunch of random dots, and they could feel, but they were actually feeling a little uh, uh, force robot. Uh, and so it was entirely virtual, and they could thereby put these two signals in opposition or, or have some discrepancy between them. They could be noisy. And they discovered that the way people combine these two sources of information um, respects the uncertainty that they, ins well, respects the uncertainty that should be induced by the noise that they in just inserted into each one of those uh, signals. Um, uh, Conrad Kerding and Ulrich Byerholm and their collaborators uh, then showed that uh, one all, you know, people also are able to um, sort of appropriately decide whether two sources of information ought to have come from the same source, as in the ventriloquist illusion, or not. Uh, Louise Whiteley and I did an experiment where we asked whether when uh, looking at the inherent uncertainty that people seem to have in the way that they respond to, um, uh, in this case, they were asked to decide which of these two gratings, or rather, whether the lower grating was displaced left or right of the upper one. So it's a, it's like a physical task. People seem to suddenly be noisy in their responses. They ought, therefore, to have some uncertainty that's associated with that noise. 
Uh, and we asked whether, if that's the case, would they adjust their answers if they were given an asymmetric payoff? Uh, so it was cost more to be wrong to the right than to the left in this particular example. Um, and the answer was yes, again, that people were able to do that, and they were able to do that without continuous feedback about how well they were doing. So they weren't just adjusting a threshold on the basis of that feedback. And then finally, in a paper that just came out uh, very recently, uh, Itai Lide, Vasson Adam, uh, a number of collaborators working with me and Mirab Bahisar, um, showed that uh, when um, uh, pe uh, people are asked to make a, a basically a working memory into temporal judgment, uh, judge which of these two tones is the higher, um, well, we didn't show this, this has been known for a while, they seem to incorporate their, um, a, the long-run history of, of uh, sensory information, in this case tone frequencies, um, in order to recover a, a less noisy version of presumably the memory stored of this first one. That's at least a, a theory that was, has been advanced by people like Jonas and Lewinstein. Um, what we showed is that they're able to do that uh, and learn very effectively a range of different prior distributions kind of depicted over here. So from Gaussians to these broad uniforms, narrow uniforms, it's a bit hard to make out the different distributions. But the point is that people acquired the distributions, they did so rapidly, and once they had done so, they acted in a way that seemed uh, effective uh, at, at uh, uh, improving their uh, uh, responses. Okay, so... Uh, the point I want to make from all of this is that it looks like these sorts of behaviors are very flexible. Uh, and for example, in the experiment that uh, Louise and I did, this was just innate uncertainty that people had. We could change the payoffs, uh, and in, people would encounter payoffs they'd never seen before. They didn't have to learn to handle those. They were able to handle that in, uh, in, uh, from the beginning. Um, and in other situations where they are required, because we don't tell them what the prior is, they have to learn it, that can be done very rapidly. Um, and this, I think, suggests, you know, it's very easy to be optimal through a lot of supervised learning if you're given, you know, evidence every time about what the right answer is. And that sort of learning doesn't need you to have a representation of uncertainty anywhere in the process. But to be flexible, to be able to adjust your action based on new con contingencies appropriately, strongly suggests that somehow the uncertainty is carried along with the signal inside the computational engine. Um, and the question now is going to be, how is this learned? How do we actually build systems that acquire that representation for uncertainty? Okay, so let me first of all just sort of sketch out a picture that again many of you have probably seen in one form or another of what we mean by computation when we're thinking about things probabilistically. Um, there's a world out there. Um, the brain kind of meets that at some boundary, which we'll explore in a moment. Um, and in the world, there are objects, and we usually care about those objects. We might also care about the configuration of the objects and things like our own position in the, in the world and therefore the configuration of the objects relative to us. I won't you know, get, get into that level of detail here. We're going to think of those objects as inducing some set of sensory features, um, and those in turn create a stimulus. So if you're thinking about images, uh, these are visual objects. These are surfaces and edges and things like that. And this is the actual image. <coughs> Sorry. That image <coughs> is then transduced by your retina. Um, and so the signal that the brain has to work with is that um, set of retinal activations or cochlear activations or uh, stretch receptor activations, whatever sense we're thinking about. Um, from those transduced stimuli, one goal is to work out what's out there in the world, right? Work out what the, what the features look like, work out what the objects are. And uh, from this point of view, the only observation that we have, you know, the only thing that the brain can work with, is that sensory input, right? So those are the observations, and here's the pro promised word latent. The rest of the stuff is latent, right? It's the, we don't observe this directly, we observe that. And so these estimates of features and these inferences about the objects that are present are estimates and inferences about latent variables. Um, and of course, we also, you know, all of these things are set in time. Things change over time, and we may learn the statistics about those. We may wish to make predictions about what things will look like in the future. Uh, and in particular, we may seek to choose actions and make predictions of the effects that those actions will have, and like to do that optimally, perhaps, with respect to some goal that may also be defined uh, from time to time. Okay, so this is sort of the general picture. Something I haven't depicted here is that this structure, which is sort of drawn in sort of these large just blobs, uh, actually has a lot of 
um, much finer structure of dependence between different pieces. Uh, so the ed this edge will depend on the particular objects um, that are creating the edge by occlusion. Um, there may be, you know, the appearance of a surface will depend on the light source and the properties of the re uh, reflectance properties of that particular surface, and will be conditionally independent given those things of many other objects in the world. It may be correlated with them, but conditioned on a set of other variables, it's independent of them. And that's a crucial idea. It leads, if you actually spelled this out into its fine detail, to a kind of um, locality or modularity in the graphical structure. And it allows us to boil down the, the job of inference and, in fact, planning in these sorts of models to really just two core operations, passing messages on and combining pairs of messages together. Now, if the graph is not entirely tree-like, so it, if there's some loops in it, this is approximate to just use these two methods. You actually have to do something more complicated to be exact, but we're going to put that aside for the moment. We're just going to think about things as being um, the operations that we need uh, as being these two. And these two are, I have um, my observation x. I might have inferred already a distribution over one latent variable, let's say it's a surface, um, from that latent variable, from that observation. And I'd like to now use that information to make an inference about perhaps the presence of an object or the nature of the object. And to do that, I need to know something about the relationships between objects and surfaces. And that is enca encapsulated in this uh, prior knowledge about the joint occurrences of those two things. Okay, so that's one thing I would want to do. And then the, the other case is where I actually have two sources of information about the same thing, and I need to put those together. And so now I have some joint, uh, and of course it may be more than two, but two will be our canonical example. Okay, so what we'd like is a system that represents uncertainty in a natural way, is able to do both of those operations, and that can learn to do that uh, from examples of some sort, and we'll come to what sorts of examples we, we're going to think about. Um, so this is a question that people have thought about for quite a while. Uh, I believe Charlie Anderson was the first one to sort of really engage with the question of how it is that uh, neuro neuronal activity might represent uncertainties. Um, it's all quite theoretical at the moment. We don't really have firm confirmation of something. We have agreement between certain experiments and certain theories in one domain, um, um, but then not necessarily in others. Um, I'm going to pick one particular one, uh, and I'm going to pick the one that I think has the most natural connection to learning, which is the basis of what I want to talk about today. Uh, and it's not, you know, it's not a new invention. It's something that people have, have been thinking about for quite a while. Uh, but it's a really very, very simple mechanism. You can already see why it might have something to do with learning. The simplest possible thing to learn is an average. And so if we can use averages to actually represent uncertainties in an appropriate way, um, then this will actually give us, perhaps, a scheme that can be embedded in more complicated learning systems uh, in order to actually represent um, the, and compute for the uncertainties we want. So what do I mean by averaging? So let's just think about something that hopefully, again, is quite familiar, the notion of a population code. So here's a, a, um, a representation uh, along some axis uh, representing the value of, of latent variable. Imagine we have a population whose activities are going to represent that value. It might be the orientation uh, of an edge at a particular point in the visual scene, for example. Um, we're used to thinking of neurons as having some sort of functional dependence of their firing rate on the value of that activity. We call it a tuning curve. Um, and what that means is that if we, there's a particular value that the population is seeking to encode, we can, for every cell, look up the value of the tuning curve there. That's its firing rate. And so now I can make another axis here, which is now uh, indexed by neuron. And I'll place the neuron index at the location of its preferred stimulus, as is common. Um, and transfer that firing rate down here. And now, of course, if I have a population of these things, I get some bump on the neural uh, surface that represents the, um, this, this value according to this population code. Okay? But as I've argued, so, you know, this Z is latent. And it, intrinsically, all latent variables come with uncertainty. Right? The situation where you know something with certainty is probably, you know, I, I imagine, has prob probability zero. Um, I certainly have no idea what's going to happen in Britain in, that, in April. <laughs> um, so, suppose that this latent variable came along with this belief about its value, right? So I have now have a distributional belief. I don't know what this value is, but I can express what knowledge I have in terms of, prob of a probability distribution. How does this get encoded in the same population? 
Right? So again, the simple proposal is that the answer is that, ra that the firing rates, rather than being given by an evaluation of this function at one value of z, are given by the average under this distribution uh, of that tuning curve activity, of that yeah. tuning curve prediction. Okay, and so this has the nice property that in the event of certainty, if it ever occurs, we'll collapse back to the, the simple tuning curve description of a functional relationship. Okay, and so now for this particular distribution, you'll get some set of activities that look like this, and you might imagine that this sort of picture will be um, you know, sufficient to carry information uh, about, the, um, about the distribution. Uh, but let's look at that a little bit more carefully. Let me just say before we go there, um, we are, we've taken now to referring to these things as uh, distributed distributional codes, or DDCs. Uh, the name has sort of adjusted a little bit over the years, depending on exactly what people have been looking at. But they date back at least to this 98 paper uh, by Rich Semmel, Peter, and Alex Puget. Um, and uh, Peter and I, uh, when I mentioned the work I did as a postdoc, uh, I guess you now know how many years ago, uh, was um, uh, we were looking at this in a slightly more slightly more complicated uh, setting, and so called it a doubly distributional code, but that's not going to be relevant uh, to what we talk about today. Okay, uh, so these are the DDCs, and one question is, um, you know, I've, I've suggested that the DDC carries the uncertainty information, uh, does it really, and, and what can we say about that? So, um, one way to think about what a DDC does uh, is to pr place constraints on each neuron, each firing rate, pr provides a constraint on the underlying distribution. So I'm now, for this two-dimensional distribution that looks somewhat complicated, I'm going to choose as my tuning curves, if you like, uh, basically this sort of representation. There's some vector w that points in this direction. I take a dot product with that, that's down here, and I just uh, do a half-wave rectification or a, lin a threshold linear function on that. Okay? So here's a function that's zero down here and then ramps up. Uh, I can take the um, expectation of this function value under this distribution, and that gives me a number, and the hypothesis is that that number is a firing rate. Okay. Um, and I can do this for a number of different such functions, with W pointing in different directions, and also with offsets, so they all don't all go through zero. Um, and as a result, I'll get a family of firing rates. And as I said, each one of those tells me something about the distribution of mass in this picture, right? It tells me you know, if, you, if this was actually a simple threshold, it would tell me what the integral of the mass is on this side. Uh, and I could use all of those mass integrals to work out what's going on. It's a little bit subtler than that with the threshold linearity. Um, now, if I ask what is the distribution um, that maximize, that, that satisfies those constraints, but is otherwise as unconstrained as possible, is maximally uncertain, or has highest entropy, the answer is this one. Okay, so it's a distribution defined by this exponential form um, where the, the functions, the basis functions or tuning curves, appear in the exponent, and there's some coefficients. The coefficients are actually quite hard to get. If I just tell you the constraints and say go off and maximize the entropy, it's not easy to find, work out what those coefficients are. Okay? But they exist. There's a, you know, the, they can be solved for. And in particular, in this particular case, if we solve for them, uh, this is the density of the corresponding distribution that we get out, and it's a pretty good depiction with just about 20 basis functions in this case. Um, two side notes for those of you who like to think about probability distributions. Uh, these things are, of course, members of the exponential family of distributions, um, and it might be worth noting that we can describe a member, a specific member of, of a manifold of such distributions, I said manifold, um, with an eta and a, uh, or with r. And these are two dual representations. One are called the natural parameters, the other are called mean parameters. And, and under some constraints about the nature of the function psi, they're equivalent. Um, the second thing it's worth pointing out is that there's some interesting relationships to some ideas that have been quite current in machine learning uh, over the last decade or so. Um, so there's, there's actually an accumulation of theory for thinking about these and analogous <coughs> ideas for representation. OK, um, so let's now think about uh, computing with these objects. So I said that finding those natural parameters, the eaters, is difficult, uh, which might suggest that this representation isn't very useful because usually we want to think about distributions in terms of their densities. But the point is that most of the things we actually want to do with distributions are calculate expectations of them, with respect to them. Okay? That's true of 
the operations of belief propagation, this kind of conditional calculation that I sketched out in those two uh, figures before. Uh, that's true of making decisions where what I might want to do is calculate the, calculate the expected payoff of various different actions that I might be considering. Um, and it's actually true of learning as well, uh, using the framework of variational learning or, or expectation maximization, where the key thing that you need to calculate having to do with the latent variables is the expected value of the statistics of those latent variables, uh, or equivalently, the expected value of the gradient of the log joint probability. And so the idea behind using DDCs for computation is if the set of basis is, is actually very close to the idea behind using a population code uh, for computations on specific values. If you have a flexible enough basis set, then if I, need to, if I have a function f whose expectation I wish to evaluate, and it can be written as a linear combination in that basis, perhaps with a, 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 you know, a, um, a threshold linearity, uh, uh, um, depending on the uh, quality of the approximation, then I can calculate the expectation of the function by just plugging in the expectations of the basis set, right? Expectations are linear. So it's a very trivial observation, but it's what allows us to use these representations and actually propagate information effectively within them. So let's see how that works. I said that there are two key operations that we'd like to be able to implement, uh, and let's ask what those look like if they're implemented by a DDC representation. So here's the first thing we want to do. We want to take information re re expressed as a belief about Z1 uh, and transform it into a belief about Z2, knowing the relationship a priori between Z1 and Z2. Um, that's what, that's the a calculation that we want to do written out as an equation. Um, so imagine now that, you know, instead of this just P of Z1, given X, I actually have a DDC encoding that. So I have expected values of some set of basis functions, psi1, um, evaluated on Z1 according to this distribution. And imagine, too, that I have a set of connections which provide a, such that the, this, which is a function of Z1, and is actually the conditional expectation of a basis function on Z2, given that value of Z1, that's what this thing here says, can be expanded linearly in terms of the basis functions on Z1. So if you don't want to worry about what this function is, just pay attention to the fact that I've written down a function of Z1, right? Z2 has been integrated out here, so the only variable that remains is Z1. Um, so I've just got a function of Z1. It only uh, depends on the joint. Oh, I've lost my joint. It, it only depends on the joint between Z1 and Z2. It's the thing that I, I know about. Um, and therefore, I can learn somehow, we'll come back to how, uh, to approximate it, um, that function, by a linear combination of the basis vectors that I have. If I can do that, then I can calculate expectations of the basis functions on Z2, given the conditional co expectations on Z1 by linear operations. Okay? Um, and again, you know, if we define these basis functions to be non-negative, uh, then these expectations need to be non-negative, and so approximation error can be reduced to some degree by a, by a linear threshold operation here. Okay. Uh, what about Q combinations? So it gets a little bit more complicated when you have two sources of information. Now I have a, a joint over three things, and as I get more and more, I will have a joint over a larger number of things. Um, and now we want to calculate this double integral, in effect. Um, and so now the answer turns out to be, a, rather than linear, a multilinear combination of the different sources. So now what I want is a function of both Z1 and Z2 that can be written out as a combination of basically outer product basis vectors in Z1 and Z2 space. And so then that whole thing turns out to be linear from the outer product space or equivalently linear in each one of the individual um, Z1 or Z2 inputs. Okay? Uh, and so again, I can calculate expectations here uh, just by taking the expected values of these size in Z1 and Z2 space uh, and multiplying them now by this, this tensor of, major, of, of objects. You might worry a little bit, and, and we do, that as you increase more and more uh, messages together, the dimensionality of this object gets very large, uh, in which point you'd want to start thinking about perhaps factored low rank approximations to it. Uh, and that's sort of a slightly open question as to how, how effective those might or might not be. But one of the posters actually that uh, um, Kevin looked, uh, presented yesterday uh, showed that actually even in this situation, doing something just entirely linear is quite effective. So the bilinearity, while formally valuable, may not be essential. 
Okay, what about learning? Right, that's our computation. I said I wanted to get here because it was e relatively easy to do learning. So how do we think about learning? Well, of course, the point about expectations being easy to learn is most easily illustrated in the simple case of supervised learning. Suppose that I actually get to observe the objects in some you know, um, indirect, or, or you know, rather some um, implausibly direct way. So I have my image, and the teaching signal comes in and activates the appropriate neuron in my brain that corresponds to the object that's present in that image. Okay, so, so an unrealistic supervised learning case. Um, and I do that many times. I have samples of images and I have samples of objects uh, drawn from the appropriate joint distribution over both of those two things. Then if I just try to train an arbitrary function approximator, let's call it a neural network, that, um, such that the input uh, is the image and the output is not Z, but this basis function representation of Z. And I do the training, so I've got some parameters row in here, which are uh, the parameters of my function approximator, the weights of the neural network, if you like. Uh, and I uh, update those just according to the delta rule. So I just change them uh, in, the, uh, in a direction such that the output of the network gets closer uh, to the uh, target function in terms of these tuning curves. Uh, then I will converge such that the output of the network, given an x, uh, approaches the expectation of the basis function. Okay, because basically means, expectations, minimize squared errors, which is where that delta rule came from. Okay, but of course we don't have access to supervised learning. Um, so we're going to think about unsupervised learning, or I guess what uh, Jan wanted to call self-supervised learning, but I'm not sure I see the difference. Um, and um, I'm going to go back again to another piece of old thinking, and, or, or uh, uh, you know, an old idea, uh, old but good thinking, um, which I, uh, you know, also is attributed to Peter, uh, but also uh, he was working with Rich Demmel, uh, Radford Neal, and Jeff Hinton. Um, and this is something called a Helmholtz machine. And the Helmholtz machine is a way of basically achieving unsupervised learning using a pair, effectively, of supervised learning systems that train each other. Okay? Uh, so I now have two models. A generative model, this is my model of the way the world is built. It's the way, it's an internal simulator. It's something that can say, uh, if these are the objects in the world, this is what images will look like. Um, and there's a recognition model, which takes an image and produces an estimate of what the objects or features or all the various latent variables we care about are given that image. Uh, and as I said, these two models train each other. And they do so using an algorithm that was called wake-sleep. In the wake phase, um, the idea is that the recognition model takes in observations of real images, because our eyes are open, and infers the various latent variables or some representation of them. It was, a in the original work, a, a, a mean field representation of them. Um, and then uses that representation to update this model, um, which effectively means um, traveling on the gradient of some parameters in it with respect to a function that can be evaluated. I won't go into the details of what that function is. Uh, and then the sleep phase, um, so, so in, in effect what's happening in the wake phase is the output of this model is being used to train that one. And now in the sleep phase, we generate images from imagined objects, that is the dream. <coughs> and in that process, uh, there are you know, we, we have examples of the mapping that is under our current model of the world, and we train the recognition model according to, the, to those outputs, right? So it's this alternation between these two. So the only difference in what we're going to do is that rather than having this mean field representation of the latent variables, we're going to have one of these distributed representations of uncertainty. And the point is that that gives you a much richer depiction of all of the correlated uncertainty in the variable, and that improves the quality of your learning. Uh, and again, because of the structure of this, uh, sort of this Markovian structure where there's a set of objects that induce features that induce images, as, as we've drawn it here, um, the recognition system also works as sort of a feed-forward um, and um, uh, sort of Markovian structure like this. So it's the intermediate layer that feeds up to the top layer in this particular case. Um, and so, the idea is that we can use, still use the recognition model to train the uh, generative model in the, um, in the wake phase. And we can do that because, remember I said, there's a gradient of a function that we need to follow. 
Well, it's a function, as it turns out, of the latent variables and the parameters as well. Uh, and so I can expand that gradient as a linear combination of my basis functions that the DDC provides, and thereby calculate the expected value of that gradient, which is also the gradient of expectation of the function, uh, given expected values of the basis functions, which is what the DDC gives me. So I know how to update my model given recognition. And it depends, in some sense, you know, to, to, to make this sort of a, a, a plausible operation, depends on uh, having this DDC representation, which also carries a much richer representation of the correlational structure of the latent variables at the same time. Um, now I need to learn the recognition model, and I also need to learn one more thing, which is I need to learn these coefficients here, uh, which are gamma on this slide. I fear that they're going to change name suddenly on the next slide, if I remember correctly. Um, and, but I can do both of those things together by the simulation approach. I can generate samples of, fr from my current model, um, use those to train a network that takes the generated sampled output or image to these basis function representations of the latent variables, and also train parameters as I said, they've changed name to alpha, but parameters that basically allow me to approximate uh, the gradients in here, which also depend on the samples um, Z that I've evaluated in my, in my simulation phase, uh, using this representation. And then that gives me what I need to do the weight phase. Okay, um, I'm gonna show you, so, so this work uh, appeared in um, the conference and now abbreviated NeurIPS uh, just this year. And, uh, well, I guess last year at this point, and um, I'm just going to show you some results from uh, that paper, actually one that um, um, sort of has a slightly more neural context. This is a little toy. It's data generated from an extremely sparse combination uh, of sources. So it's two-dimensional data. You can see that basically they either lie along this axis or along this axis, and that's true in every case. These are the data being generated. And what we've done is we fit two models to this. And Helmholtz machine that's trained has this representation based on DDCs. And the other is what's called a variational autoencoder, uh, which is a model that is, a, again, a probabilistic model, but it's making a factorial assumption. That is, it's assuming independence between the different components of uh, Z, in this case, in the posterior. And that's a bad assumption uh, for this sort of model, because I know something came either from here or from there. That's a, a, a strong uh, ex a, um, example of what's called explaining away. That introduces a correlation uh, in the posterior. And the DDC is able to capture that and therefore learn to generate, the orange points here are things generated from the DDC, uh, from, the, from the generative model learnt using the DDC representation to train it. Uh, and these are what the variational order encoder generative model yields, uh, which, because it fails to learn uh, in the posterior about the sort of separation between these two things, it also ends up uh, not being sparse enough in the generative model. Um, probably not worth going into that. Um, the, um, uh, here's an example. So, so I said that one of the features here is that what's happening is that the representation carries much more structure uh, about, one's, about the appropriate belief over the latent variables. Uh, and that's illustrated here. This is um, a very similar model, actually, but sort of tuned to actually be a, a sort of not completely implausible picture of what might happen in olfaction. You've got uh, sources uh, generating odorants, and the odorants then induce activity in ORNs. Uh, and in, um, we can then look at the posterior distribution over odorants uh, learned by this model uh, and contrast it to what we see with the VAE. And what we're seeing here is um, the... Um, uh, the dots here are estimates uh, generated by eff effectively, sorry, the, the true model values are contours that are generated by sampling, um, which is somewhat laborious in this model, so it takes quite a long time to build it, but it's small enough that we can do it. Um, the dots are samples that are constructed from the DDC Helmholtz machine representation. And you can see that these things agree quite nicely, whereas the VAE dots, uh, do not. If you look at the contour structure, you can see the factorial uh, sort of nature in here, right? These basically look like they're circular or elliptical along the axes rather than these funny shapes that they should be. 
Um, we can also, both of those cases, we were basically running on toy data that was generated from the same graphical model as we were fitting. We might take the natural data and ask, you know, what does it look like there? Uh, so the, this was a, just a set of little patches uh, drawn from the Van Hafner Natural Image Database. Um, we fit a very similar kind of two-layer-ish model, so the sort of thing you'd imagine uh, you might do with a sparse coding uh, style model. Um, number of different architectures in terms of the sizes of these different layers. But in each case, we can contrast to the VAE, and these numbers are basically a measure of how close the um, samples generated by the generative model uh, in each case are uh, to a, a sample of actual images drawn, another sample of images drawn from that, the Van Houten database. Uh, and you can see that uh, we're much closer in the case of the Hemmelt machine um, with a kind of um, in, in slightly embarrassing p-value when you do the statistical test. Okay, um, I just, I'm, just to close, um, I just wanted to mention, um, although it's now yesterday, so if you happen to have a time machine, you can go back and see the posters. If not, you can try to find uh, Kevin and Esther and talk to them about it, um, which looked at uh, both time series and planning. Um, and so one of them was looking basically at uh, using the same idea of simulation uh, to learn how to, uh, to learn a Markovian dynamical structure in, a, um, in an environment um, and to uh, simultaneously learn to filter, that is to estimate the current state given the past history of observations from that state. Um, and then Esther was using, a, in some ways, a similar learning context, but now looking at learning predictive estimates using a successor representation. So asking questions about, can we learn how um, transitions in an environment happen as encoded in uh, the sort of uh, linear propagator on basis functions, which are very similar to DDC basis functions. Okay. Um, right, so let me just close. Um, the idea is that averages are a very kind of convenient object. Uh, they're objects that are able to encode distributions effectively through this sort of maximum entropy argument. Um, they facilitate the kinds of computation that we need to do to make inferences and to plan and to, um, uh, um, and to evaluate uh, sort of different courses of action. Um, and they're representations that can be learned easily in a supervised context, but they can also be learned in an unsupervised context, provided we have a way to simulate from our belief of the model. And so it's a combination of simul simulation. Um, I've talked about simulation at the moment where we generate entire images. Um, what we're working on at the moment is being, and some of that you uh, would have seen on the posters yesterday, uh, where the simulations are much more local and involve a, a smaller um, kind of simulation just from the current state, for example, rather than simulating from an entire, um, uh, from the entire generative model of the world. All right, let me finish by, um, again, thanking uh, Esther, Kevin, and indeed Peter, um, uh, the other people in my lab. Um, this is where the SWC and we um, are, are when we're not in Wales, or when they're not in Wales. Uh, for those of you who saw Sonia's talk, uh, you'll notice that the weather actually is quite, much, quite a bit nicer in London than it is in Wales. That's not an atypical situation. Um, but it is a wonderful place to work, and if you're interested in working there, do come and speak with us. Thank you. Uh, so we have some time for questions. I'd, I'd like to ask uh, students and postdocs if they could uh, go first. Okay, Zach can be a student can I, today. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be a student. So uh, Manish, one yes. of the things that you're doing here is using graph structure. Yep. And the graph structure is naturally related to the natural parameters rather than the expectation parameters. So if you're doing belief propagation or mm. Kalman filtering, you're going back and forth between expectation parameters and natural parameters is uh, one way to do it. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if you're using kernel embeddings, then you know in the infinite dimensional space, you can do a lot of those other operations maybe as linear. So how mm -hmm. are you thinking about the, the natural parameters in the graph context? And is that all still linear in the basis function approach? Uh, so to, the short answer is yes. I mean, you can look at the two, well, the, the, the kind of 
The formal approach is actually multilinear, right? And that was the information combination example that I showed you. So actually, it's up here, right? I said that these are two different latent variables inferred from here. One of these could be a, an estimate of current state inferred from past observations, and this one might be the current observation. And this calculation that puts them together is exactly the same calculation. So the sort of the, the formal result here would look multilinear, and that actually matches what you'd get if you were thinking about these infinite dimensional representations, the kernel embedding. Um, the, uh, our empirical work, uh, which again was what Kevin was talking about yesterday, suggests that actually a linear combination of these things loses very little accuracy, um, at least in, to the dimensionalities we've explored. We don't know if that'll still be true as the dimensionality grows substantially. But we don't need access to the natural parameters. The natural parameters don't show up in here. We're working mean parameters to mean parameters, just as one would if one were using mean embeddings, or indeed predictive state representations. Right? That's why I said there is a, there's, there's a nice link to work that people have done in machine learning to, uh, that we can rely on. Um, uh, thanks for a great talk, Manish. I was curious to ask you a bit more about the choice of basis function. So you, uh, you suggested. You didn't tell us anything about whether there's an yep. optimal choice of basis functions, or you suggested here that we would be best off using, or you're using projections onto one dimension of latent space, and then they're 1D yep. basis functions. Would it, I mean, neurons we know have tuning to multiple, multiple dimensions of the input space. I guess, could you reflect on whether it's nice to have these one-dimensional projected basis functions or multi-dimensional? How, how, how should we think about that problem? Um, so you, want, you certainly want sensitivity to the more than one discrete input dimension if you want to be able to capture um, intrinsic correlation between those in your representation. Um, the representation I had here wouldn't necessarily exclude that if the two axes that I'm drawing, if one of them is uh, color and one of them is orientation, then I can represent a joint over color and orientation uh, just by angling the, ve the, the vector here. So this doesn't exclude sort of joint sensitivities. Um, the more general question, how do you in effect learn the appropriate basis functions, uh, I think is something that, that from, is, is still open for us. We know ways to do it but they depend on backpropagation, and a large part of what we're trying to do at the moment is avoid the need for backpropagation. Um, there are other ways you could, you could uh, imagine trying to do it, but th these are things that we're exploring at the moment. Right now, we take them as given. Are those basis functions just the tuning curves, or is it, is it not fallout? Right? Well, they would, be the they would be the tuning curves if one ever had certainty. But the question is, do we ever have certainty, right? Presumably, you can set up an experiment so that there's relatively little uncertainty, and then you should get a pretty good approximation. The tuning curve, in that case, should become a pretty good approximation to the basis function. Hi, Manish. Hey. Uh, I know you said that you would not talk about a single bit of data here, but knowing yes. you, I can't possibly imagine that you haven't been thinking about this. And, <laughs> um, and so one question that comes up quite naturally, especially in the context yeah. of previous literature here, yeah. is that what, what, what should we expect from uh, DDCs, yep. uh, and in particular how experimentally measurable tuning curves change in DDCs under conditions of reduced certainty. Right. So it seems to me, maybe very superficially, mm -hmm. that this would, based on this, you would expect a broadening of tuning curves, which is of course exactly the thing that people have argued is what, what yep. is not happening and what has been used as one of the main motivations for other kinds of representations, including PDCs. Right. Okay, so since Mate asked the question, I can rely on Mate's work to answer it. Um, <laughs> so the issue, and, and this is, it's, a, it's an extremely thorny issue, uh, is that um, in order to make a serious prediction, you need to know three things, basically. You need to know uh, what, is, what inference is being represented by the population. Uh, you need to know what model uh, the system believes or is using to make that inference, and you need to know the code. Uh, and you need to have basis functions as part of this code in this particular case. Um, and so as you pointed out, if you think about not the representation of, say, orientation in B1, not as a representation of an estimate of orientation, but of an estimate of a basis function where there's a contrast term multiplying it, then, in, you know, so what we would get here would be the same thing as you would get as an average of the samples if you were sampling from the corresponding distribution because it's an expectation. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank Manish again and... Uh...